And joining us here on the Mercedes-Benz Vance phone line is a man who covers the Nets for the worldwide leader in sports, Nick Friedel. How you doing, Nick? Rich, I got to tell you something really quick. Uh, mm-hmm. I sent you a letter when I was 12 wanting to get into sports broadcasting. Get out of here. And you were one of the only people who responded. <laughs> So it is a hell of an honor for me to be able to talk to you in general. Uh, I wish we were under better circumstances, but I I really appreciate that you did in that moment. And uh, thanks for uh, laying the path down for people like me to follow. I don't know what what path I laid, but I'm glad that I did, did, I did respond. And and I'm glad to see that you actually found your way into the, to the business. That's pretty cool, man. I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. I appreciate that. All right. Now, uh, now that we're all, is there anything else you'd like to share, Nick? Uh, we can get that out. I know my mom is watching Donna in Orlando. So <laughs> shout out to Donna, who's been watching the <laughs> sports center for like 25 she years. She must be quelling. So Donna <laughs> must be quelling down there. Um, so <laughs> she must be in full quell mode right now. Um, so right here on the Roku channel. Thanks for watching, Donna. How are you? Hey, Miss Donna. There you go. Very good. Um, let's. You're 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 spot on to say about better circumstances because this is a very uh, deep subject, clearly, and one I'm sure you – did you get any grief for your your challenging Kyrie Irving at all, the way that you did over the weekend, Nick? My, so, my social media is a mess. <laughs> That's where it really has come from. Uh, and it's really – it's disgusting, some of the responses, because, Rich, I, I'm just doing my job. I just want to ask questions that I felt like are important. And in the moment – When I had the back and forth that now a lot of people have seen, it didn't feel that much different to me because Kyrie and I, I I got on the beat in January. I switched from the Warriors to the Nets. I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And he and I had gone back and forth on the vaccination stuff a lot last season. So in the moment, it didn't feel any different, even though the subject matter uh, was much more important didn't feel any different from a, a back and forth standpoint. It wasn't until that night and the next couple of days where people were calling me on my phone or texting me and just saying thanks. Not just because I, I pushed them. There were a lot of journalists that reached out, which I appreciated, but just people that could care less about basketball or sports that had seen that and that had been really hurt by those initial posts and, and wanted to get a, a clear cut answer. From him and Rich, we, we didn't get one Saturday, and I just walked out of that press conference a couple hours ago in Brooklyn. We didn't get one today, so there are a lot of different layers here. But uh, yeah, it, it's been a weird few days for me for sure. I, I I'm sure now. As, as for the answers that that we heard today, I mean, I played the uh, lion's share of the six minute of media availability at the end of the second hour, including the very um, intense soliloquy that that um Kyrie had about his experience and his upbringing and his ancestry and wanting the same intensity brought about uh to to the hate speech that he feels and that he grew up with and that he feels and every day and I heard that and I'm like well yeah that's that's basically what I've been saying over the last several days and how hurtful it is that he would place on his Twitter account um, a documentary that fuels all of that and 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 so there just seems that there could be common ground but I'm wondering why there isn't in his mind what is there anything you could sort of uh, I I know that you know delving into his psyche might not be the, the best use of our time together but I'm I'm trying to figure it out Nick I think the hard part for Kyrie Rich in again covering him day after day in this last year is it's about control. He doesn't want to feel like he uh, is uh, saying or doing something that somebody is making him say or do. Having talked to Kyrie, and I, I've had several conversations with him before this in the last couple of weeks, I can't stress this part enough. He wants so desperately to be a bridge for the generation coming behind him. And he has, I've talked to him about it, he, white, black, every ethnicity or religion, he is so proud of the fact that so many kids watch him play, that so many different people wear his jersey from all different walks of life. That's why those initial posts uh, that he made a week ago were so surprising. And the answers, uh, the, the hardest part with Kyrie, Rich, is he wants to 
be dug in on what he believes and, and what his position is. But so many times he struggles to articulate that. And you're left trying to, as a journalist, transcribe what he's saying and, and make sense of the commentary sometimes. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a strange juxtaposition because this is a guy who appreciates so much ha- how so many people in the game look at him. The younger players on the, this Nets roster idolize him. They look up to him immensely as a leader. He knows how many people appreciate what he has done on the floor. But at the same time, he's posting links to anti-Semitic stuff. And instead of just saying, I'm sorry, like so many people in the league and in the Nets organization wanted to hear from him, he does not do that. And he decides not to say yes or no whether he has anti-Semitic beliefs. He just makes things so much more difficult on himself than they have to be. So if you've had these conversations with him, I don't know how many of, uh, of your colleagues have had similar conversations with him on subject matters outside of basketball. Why would he then accuse you in the middle of a press conference of trying to make uh, uh, yourself famous out of the exchange between the two of you? Why? It, it, it really bothered me, Rich. And I think a lot of it ties back into the uncomfortable exchanges at times we had last season with the vaccination uh-huh. stuff. But a lot more of it, in my mind, was what happened on media day. And for those that hadn't seen that clip, I went to ask a question. He was sitting up at the podium, and he he doesn't even let me get the first few words of the, the question out. He says, you and me, we're going to be best friends by the end of the year. And I say, Kyrie, I thought we already were best friends. He's like, you think that now. You think that now, but we're going to really be best friends. You're going to give me a hug by the end of the year. And Rich, that's Again, just from my perspective, that's the craziest part of the last few days is because player after player, coach after coach, Steve Nash, before he decided he, he wanted out of this thing and that came to that agreement with the Nets, were raving about how Kyrie was responding to everything in the locker room. And everybody had said repeatedly that they felt like he had turned a corner in how uh, he was uh, responding to everybody and how he was treating everybody, and how he was playing on the floor and being a leader. So for it all to go up in flames on so many different levels in the last few days, even seeing it day in and day out, it's been pretty stunning. Nick Friedel covers the Nets for ESPN, joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. So moments ago, you just said Steve Nash decided he wanted out. So that's the mutual part about it? Walk me through what you know about the departure of Steve Nash from this franchise. This past week. Rich, this, this is one of the few times where I believe the, <laughs> the statement from a team where uh, Sean mutual. Marks and Steve Nash sat down, as Mark said, and, and just said, you know what, this is not working. Uh, and I can just tell you that since I got there in January, I can't stress enough how much the off-the-court stuff was weighing on Nash. All the drama, and it's not just on Kyrie, of course, this summer. I mean, that was just wild. You don't see those type of stories with Durant asking for the trade and then reportedly asking for Nash and Mark to be fired and then pulling the trade back. All of that, not just in the last couple days, but over uh, the last couple years, was weighing on him. You talk to people in the organization, they would tell you that they'd see Steve, and and you used to seeing this mild-mannered guy, who's walking around with a smile on his face and you see him up at those press conferences and you can just tell that he's sitting there going, what the hell am I doing in this mess? Because it, it, so much of it was not about basketball. It was about stuff going on off the floor. Now I know Nash is competitive and I know how badly he wanted to be able to turn things around. Uh, but I think there's a, a lot of relief there that he's not in the middle of this mess because Rich, I, I've been covering the league 15 years now. I've never seen a more dysfunctional team in my life. Wow. Ever. What, like, covered, what, what, what can you, what sort of, uh, you know, information can you, can you divulge here about the off the court stuff? Um, and um, that, that you want to just jump out here with on that? Well, I, I think for me, it's in comparison to what I've seen covering things in the past. I had the end of the Tibbs, Derrick Rose, Garham Pax, Bulls. I saw up close the Jimmy meltdown uh, in Minnesota, the last year of KD 
with the Warriors and, and how messy that got over time. This is different, though, because this is a whole bunch of drama that builds up and seemingly builds on itself. Uh, and, and the example here is uh, forget the Kyrie stuff and the Kevin Durant stuff for a moment. They acquired Ben Simmons. He didn't play all of last year. He comes back, and this just adds to the dysfunction internally. He's not the same player. And now he's got a swollen knee, and that's after he had back surgery over the summer. And you've added a max player who's not living up to his max contract, and you're putting another layer of uh, just uh, seemingly basketball craziness to a team that was built to win a championship. And we've heard the, the Ime Udoka reports, and Awoj has reported it, and that, that seems to be hanging now, uh, in the next day or two, we, we could get word. But to add a coach who is currently suspended by another NBA team to take over a team that many thought was going to fall apart and they'd have to press the button on a rebuild over the summer, it just makes you shake your head and you realize that great teams in the league, they have camaraderie and they make move after move that helps the move before it. This Nets team, Rich, they don't have camaraderie, and they have made move after move that have eroded at the culture they had before they made the decision to land KD and Kyrie. But I'd say this, it's a decision that everybody in the league would have made given the same set of circumstances mm-hmm. a few years ago. But it has exploded in a way here in Brooklyn, the likes of which the NBA hasn't seen in a long time. But, I mean, Nick Friedel here from ESPN, you said moments ago that the young kids look up to Kyrie in the locker room. They lionize him in the locker room. So what's the dysfunction in the locker room? Is it Durant and Kyrie together? Is that what was weighing over this summer uh, on top of Steve Nash that eventually built up to the point where he he mutually wanted out? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it was all of it. And, and KD is still – one of the very best players really? in the game. I don't think that uh, anybody is questioning how hard he works or, or how much he wants to be out there. Rich, it's just a, a combination of all these factors off the floor. And I think the hardest part, not only for the players, but the people inside the organization, the people that are working in their day-to-day, you're seeing all this stuff and you're seeing all the headlines and all the drama built. And absolutely it weighs on you. As much as you try to push everything off, I mean, I'll give you another example. The other night against the Bulls, Kyrie had four points. Kyrie averages 30 a game. Mm. For all the stuff that happens off the floor with Kyrie Irving, what people around the league have always respected is that no matter what, what was going on off the floor, when the lights came on, you knew he would dominate most nights. And you knew he would be there and put up the numbers that he's always put up. That didn't happen the other night. And I think what you started to see early in this season is all the frustration and all that drama that built in the summer. And let's go back to the end of last season, getting swept by the Celtics and all the uncertainty with with Kyrie back on the floor on a full-time basis because of the vaccination stuff in New York. All of that lingered. And they thought they had all these good vibes. And it was legitimate for a few weeks in training camp. But it all disintegrated because they lost games the decision was made on Nash and now you've got this extra layer of the Kyrie stuff with these social media posts and I think everybody in that organization is looking around at each other going what in the hell is going on and Rich then on top of all this you've got all the stuff with Udoka that could potentially be coming so it's just it's a soap opera in the pro sports the likes of which I've never seen uh, but I do think that all of those different storylines and all of the things that have played out have absolutely impacted all of the good feelings that they were trying to build up before the season. Mm. Last one for you then, Nick Friedel, is uh, the way that the press conference ended today with Kyrie. He didn't answer a direct question on whether he met directly with the Anti-Defamation League. He said that he had heard that they uh, you know, wanted to reach out and they handled it. I mean, he could have easily said, yes, I sat down with him. But then again, it would be one of those things he just doesn't want to give in on any friend to make it seem like he 
you know, he met with somebody because he was forced to or anything like that. The commissioner came out and made a statement uh, that the joint statement between the Nets, Kyrie, and the ADL was not sufficient enough for him. Where does this all go from here, do you think? I would think Adam Silver is going to listen back to those six minutes that we should know, Rich, were cut off by a Nets PR staffer. And he'd listen and just go, okay, uh, we, we, we've got to have this conversation sooner than later. The strange part about all this to me, not only as a journalist who covers the league, but who's following all this stuff day after day, the league has done next to nothing. They release that statement. They don't have Kyrie's name in it. The Nets release that initial statement. Kyrie's name's not in it. The Players Association releases a statement. Kyrie's name is not in it. They let this thing linger for days. And so now Silver comes out just before Kyrie spoke, and all that the league wanted to hear and the Nets wanted to hear were two words, I'm sorry. And that didn't happen. And so you, you tie that in with the lack of a response when asked, do you have anti-Semitic beliefs? You tie that in with, did you meet with the ADL? And he does not answer that question. I would think that the league is watching and saying, all right, we need to have this conversation and we need to move it up. But, Rich, the league and the Nets screwed this one up from an optic standpoint because they all saw what unfolded Saturday night. And now we're sitting here on Thursday afternoon and this story has crossed that threshold past just a basketball or a sports story. This story now is in the news cycle, and that's the worst place for it to be for awful reasons. And instead of making everything kind of calm down, what Kyrie did just a couple hours ago was seemingly uh, make more questions than he did uh, have any answers. All right, I lied. There's one more. Is Utoka really coming? Is he really coming? It feels like that. It, it really does, and, and I'll be honest, Rich, when, when Woj put that out, even for the Nets, I'm looking down and I'm seeing the tweets and I start talking to people around the organization, and I'm like, you, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> right now? Really? And I, nobody is questioning Ime Udoka's basketball acumen. Uh, the, the players respect the hell out of him in Boston. He's got plenty of relationships dating back to his time with the Nets as an assistant, but to throw that layer of all of this into the circus that is the Brooklyn Nets, I I mean, I feel like they just play the NWO music when they come out to the floor and just lean into it all the way because they are so unlikable for so many different basketball fans now who look around and go, why would you support this team given all the different issues that they're having on and off the floor? Nick, I appreciate the time. Do you still have that uh, letter I sent you years ago? I absolutely do. It's sitting at uh, Donna's house in Orlando. Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. How about that? Well, I'd, I'd love to see it. Tweet it out. Send it. I'd love to see it. <laughs> I, I'm going to get her to find it now. Oh, God. <laughs> She's anything like my mother. She's got it filed under alphabetically in somewhere. <laughs> <You know it. laughs> Next to like my fifth grade book reports. Uh, all right, Nick, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate the time. Look for more of my phone calls. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rich. You got it. That's Nick Friedel of ESPN. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 